Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to Biogeography 309. Let me introduce myself. My name is Camilo Mora. I'm originally from Colombia. I did an undergrad uh, at a university in Colombia, a PhD at a university in Canada, a postdoc at a university in New Zealand, a postdoc at a university in California, and a postdoc at the University of the Housey in uh, Canada. Uh, for the last 11 years, I have been a professor here at the University of Hawaii. My lab has published over 80 scientific publications, 12 of those papers have been in journals like Nature and Science. Uh, out of the millions of papers that are published every year, three times we have been among the top 100 most influential papers in 2011, 2013, 2017. The papers that we have published have been highlighted in the New York Times and Washington Post 12 times. We have been also in CNN, Time Magazine, you name it. I'm gonna be your professor about geography this year. All right, that's it about me. Let me get started. I'm gonna be taking the first uh, few classes of this course to introduce several terms that you need to know so that later on you can better appreciate some of the content that we're gonna be describing later on. So the first two classes, bear with me. We're gonna be looking about different terms, probably not related to each other, but I need you to get those terms before we get uh, moving forward. Let's start with bi what is biogeography. The specific definition of biogeography that you will find in any textbook is this one that appears here, basically the study of the distribution of species and ecosystems in geographic space and through geological time. Generally speaking, it's basically just understanding the distribution of species in space and time. Let's get down, let's go back though to the beginning to understand what we are studying, which is life, the diversity of life. Let's start by looking at the characteristics that are required for there to be life. So a scientist had already come out with a list of variables that are required for life. The first one is this one. We need to have a constant and stable source of energy. In the case of the solar system for us, that source of energy is the sun. There are two important keywords here that you need to keep in mind. One is constant in the sense that we need a source of energy to, to remain constant over time because if it keeps changing, oscillating quite a lot, then that's gonna create a problem for life to, to evolve. The second one is stable. Again, the, the, that being said, life requires time to evolve and diversify. So during that time, again, we need that source of energy to be stable. We can again try, to, we need to ensure that that source of energy doesn't change quite a lot. That's the reason again why this is the attribute, one of the most important attributes for there to be life. That source of energy needs to be constant and stable. The second attribute that has been identified as important for life is that we need, to, we need to have a terrestrial planet. There are many planets in the universe that are made out of gas. Unfortunately, on those planets, life is not possible. We need to have a substrate in which we can settle down for life to evolve. That's the second most important attribute. The third attribute that is obviously very obvious in our solar system is this, this um, one related to how far are we from the solar, from the um, source of energy. Obviously, if we are too close, it's gonna get too hot, and if we are too far, it's gonna be too cold. So we need to be in that sweet spot in which we are not too far nor too close of that source of energy for life to, to evolve. We need to have a satellite star. In the case of us, that satellite star is the moon, and the moon actually plays multiple roles in the capacity of life to emerge and, and evolve. And one that I'm gonna point out here is the capacity to stabilize the axis of rotation and translation of our planet. We didn't have that moon, the satellite star, our planet will be just spiraling out of control. And uh, so that satellite star, the moon kind of makes things settle down a little bit as well. There are many other, many other attributes that make that satellite star important for life, but that's just one attribute that I wanted to mention to you. The other attribute that is important is we need to have a, a, an orbit that in which we move around that source of energy that needs to be nearly circular. It cannot be circular because if it is circular, that means that there is no variation. So by us having a, a wave to move around the sun that looks more like an ellipse, we create variability in the case of our planet that will be the winters and the summers and that creates enough variability that then allows life to emerge and diversify. We need to be in the right place in the galaxy. A scientist had come to discover that there are 
multiple bad actors in the universe, like for instance, black holes, you know, any places in the universe that in which there is such a strong gravitational force that anything that gets closer to those places gets sucked into. It has been calculated, for instance, that if we were if we were any time close to one of those black holes, the size of the entire planet Earth will be res reduced to the, to, a, to the size of a sugar cube, just for you to realize how bad it could be if we were closer to some of those places in the universe. So again, there is a prime state, so to speak, in which we need to be located in comparison to other places in the universe. Finally, we need carbon and oxygen. Obviously, life cannot happen only once. The, 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 uh, the sweet thing about life is that it can perpetuate over time. And for that, we need to have a way to replicate the, the information over time. And in our case, that is possible thanks to carbon. Carbon, again, is, a, is a, an element that allows to uh, life to create molecules that can be replicated and perpetuated over time. The other important element for life is that one there, oxygen. So for, for a multitude of reasons, the diversity of life on the planet have moved down this pathway in which the metabolism that allows the energy to be processed at the individual level requires that oxygen. So just as here at the level of individuals, we need energy to operate the, 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 the individual itself via that metabolism that will require oxygen. We also need an energy source of energy at the, at the larger scale. And uh, we need also a magnetic shield. The idea of that magnetic shield is that you had a lot of the different types of energy produced by this source of energy, well, by this uh, main source of energy that blasts planet Earth. So thanks to the, the existence of this magnetic shield, some of these damaging uh, waves that come from the sun can be diverted and uh, as a result, life can prosper. So if we didn't have that magnetic shield, there would not be life at all in our planet Earth. Just for you to know, that magnetic shield is possible thanks to the movement of very hot materials in the core of the planet. So these materials are super hot in the core and they move up to the surface and this moving up and down creates a magnetism that again can translate to this magnetic shield that then allow us to, to expel these uh, rays that come from, from, the, from, from the sun. And right here you have the, the main attributes that make life possible. Now, what I want to do is to contextualize the significance and how rare those attributes are. So you look at the entire universe, it has been calculated that could easily be on the order of 100 billion planets that look like our, our planet Earth, 100 billion. Yet, when you look at all of them, these characteristics that I just mentioned to you, only about 10 of those planets are believed to have those characteristics. Again, okay, just for you to understand, not only the, the importance of those attributes, but the combination of those attributes is so rare that only 10 planets are likely to have those characteristics. What it means though, is that the probability of us finding another planet like ours is one in one billion. One in one billion, just for you to understand what that means, I want you to think about this. Think about whether you had won the national lottery or whether you know a person that had won the national lottery at least once. Turns out that back in the day, a student told me that he won the national lottery once and it kind of ruined my analogy. But just to, for you to understand, winning the national lottery has a probability of one in 200 million. One in one billion is like winning the national lottery five times in a row, right? And again, if you don't know a single person that has won the national lottery once, what are the chances that we're gonna find a person that will win the national lottery five times? It's gonna be almost impossible. And that again is for me to contextualize the significance of what we had in our planet, a very unique set of conditions that have made life possible. And as far as we know, there is just no other planet that will have them. In addition, obviously, a lot of people uh, don't care about that kind of stuff. A lot of people don't care about a species. If we do care, the majority of people will care about the species, not so many of them will go extinct. But one thing that most people care about is money. So here, I'm gonna give you another reason for why those species that we share the planet with are important. So there is this guy called Constanza, and what he did, he took multiple attributes that come from biodiversity that are important, like air, water, food, recreation, and medicine, and he managed to calculate the amount of money that is produced on every one of these attributes by ecosystems, and the magic number came to $33 trillion. What I want you to realize is that in the United States, for instance, we make a, a huge deal out of a deficit on the order of $16 trillion, that have been accumulated for 20 years, 
and we are kind of making a huge deal out of it when biodiversity produces twice that in every single year. And again, it's for you to understand the economic value that we had on biodiversity. Another thing that you should understand is that it doesn't really matter how big Facebook or Twitter or Instagram get to be. At the end of the day, humanity doesn't feed on those things. We feed on these species. We breathe the air that is produced by those species. It's for you to realize that at the most basic level, humanity is sustained thanks to those species as well. So again, going into why biodiversity is important. Unfortunately, humanity, we're destroying biodiversity. It's not very rare to see ecosystems that look like this converted into ecosystems that look like that. And as scientists, we have discovered that there are many things that lead to that destruction, like habitat loss, overexploitation, climate change. And today, we are, we, we are in this habit to criticize the people in Africa and the Amazon. You hear commonly those savages in the Amazon destroying the, the forest there. When in reality, what I want you to do is look outside your window and see what is there. And you most likely are gonna see buildings and roads and cars. Well, it turns out that back in the day, there was a forest there. And in that forest, there were a lot of species. All of those species are already gone. So we don't really have a moral argument today in the developed world to criticize people in the developing world when they are doing what we already did. So this transformation is not something exclusive to a single place in the planet. In fact, almost everywhere in the world that, that you have people, the same pattern has always been the same. We go to those places, we denude the land of whatever is there so that we can have our houses or roads or infrastructure and the land to eat food and things like that. So this transformation is very well documented. One of the big no-no's about presentations is never put a lot of words on a slide. I'm gonna violate my own rule here, just for me to identify, to highlight to you the amount of information already out there documenting this transformation of ecosystems. For instance, there is a paper here by Ben Harper showing that 100% of the world's oceans are already impacted by human activities. So you take a satellite image of the entire planet and look at the oceans, it turns out that there is not a single pixel that is not, is not already impacted by humanity. There is this other paper by Sanderson looking at land, the same analysis looking at how humanity is impacted different places on the land, and he found that 83% of the land is impacted by, humani by humans directly. The only places that we have not impacted are the North and South Pole, and mostly just because we cannot live there. And later on was identified that climate change is actually one of the main drivers of change there. So despite the fact that we not, don't live directly on those places, now we are impacting them thanks to climate change. So this analysis by Sanderson had to be reviewed because in his paper, he didn't analyze the impacts of climate change, but it's still quite mind blowing already that in any place where we can live humans, 83% of the, of the land has already been impacted. We lose in the order of 6 million hectares. Think about this. Six to 20 million hectares of forest are cut every single year. 14 billion trees being cut per year as well for every one of us. Somewhere around the world, somebody's cutting two trees. Global mangroves, we lost 3 million hectares in 20 years. Sea grasses, we lose 110 kilometers a year. The Caribbean coral reefs, of all of the coral reefs in the Caribbean, we already lost 80% of those coral reefs. Here, the paper by Myers and Boris Worm showing that all, all of the fishes in the ocean, those big fishes, we already lost 90% of them. Of all of the biggest fishes, sharks, tunas, you name it, 90% of those species already gone. The world's fisheries gone by, gone by 2048, a paper by Boris Worm here. And I can pretty much spend hours pointing out you to use scientific papers documenting this massive transformation of ecosystems. Basically, all of these beautiful species that we share the planet with completely gone now. Now, unfortunately, scientists have also come to discover that this transformation could be forever. Somehow we had this idea that once, once we care, we're gonna go and fix this, this destruction of ecosystems. Well, it turns out that reversing this trend might not be possible. Once we push these ecosystems to the brink, for them to come back is very difficult. The reason for this is what is called alternative equilibrium states. Basically what happens is this, you had a species and that species is adapted to a given ecosystem, right? Like I am a bird, I like living here in Hawaii, I had the perfect temperature. It turns out that if you have something that comes and stress this species, like for instance, you make it too hot for me, as a result, me as a bird, I gotta find a place where to go. And basically what I try to do is to adapt to this 
new environment. When I adapt to this new environment, basically what happens is that me as a species, we lose a lot of genes. Once those genes are gone, those genes are not coming back. And again, that's one of the things that makes this decline on biodiversity concerning in the sense that it's gonna be very hard for us to recover the ecosystems that had lost a lot of genes. And there are all other mechanisms that I'm gonna point out at the end of this class in which once we push the populations to the break, it turns out that a species, rather than recovering, if we stop the stress or the species by themselves go to extinction. For instance, when you take populations to a very low level, the individuals that are left are so far apart that they don't find each other as a result, they cannot reproduce. So even if sometimes we care and we stop these species of being destroyed, sometimes the species will go extinct by themselves because in this case, if they don't find each other, that's normally what is called Ali effect or depreciation. There is also this issue related to the uh, genetic bottlenecks. Basically, when you leave populations with so few individuals, you end up reproducing close relatives, and that leads to the inbreeding depression. Basically, the 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 uh, uh, genes that are deleterious popping up more commonly. Unfortunately. With this transformation of ecosystems, one of the things, another thing that is happening is that ecosystems from around the world are losing the capacity to provide basic things that you and I need, goods and services. And unfortunately, that's translated into a decline in human welfare. Social scientists will tell you that the reason why you have hunger in many places around the world is because there is no inequity in the, in the use of resources, there is no transport of food and, and water and things like that. But what I want you to realize is that at the most basic level, the reason why people are going hungry on certain places is because the places where they live have been destroyed in the capacity to produce what the people need in the first place. So anytime that you think about, uh, again, people going hungry, think about the fact that the land where they live has been depleted of the capacity to produce the food and water that those people need. Unfortunately, the statistics are staggering. Today, it has been estimated that around the world, a billion people one billion of us go hungry every day. Now, an av a person on average dies every second. Think about that, man. In one minute, around the world, 60 people die because they have insufficient food to, to survive. And a child under the age of five, every five seconds as a direct of poor nutrition. When it comes down to water, there are a billion people in the planet living on places where there is an incapacity of those ecosystems to provide basic water to, to these people. So you can get a picture of really what we are doing to ourselves by us destroying nature. Unfortunately, humanity is in a completely, is in a completely unsustainable path. And you can hear that and some people speak about this and you can potentially see the fact that species are going extinct and that people go hungry. Those alone are already some indications that we are in an in unsustainable path. What I wanna use here though is to give you some numbers for you to realize how unsustainable we are. So here, this is a paper that I published with my supervisor, Peter Sell, many years ago. What I did here, I took the number of people over time so by 2020, there were on the order of 7 billion people in the planet. But here, I projected the number of people up to the year 2050. Now, what I do next, I multiply the number of people by the amount of land that is required to sustain a human being well. It turns out that the minimum amount of land that you need to live well is 2.1 hectares. Obviously, today, there is a huge disparity in, in the amount of land that is used to sustain the energy demands of the people from around the world. On one stream, you have people in Saudi Arabia. A person in Saudi Arabia uses the land of 12 hectares. And a people in the, in the United States, people in the United States uses the productivity of nine hectares. Just think about the fact that a single individual in the United States uses the land that is sufficient to feed four people anywhere else in the world. Obviously, those are conditions that are wasteful. We waste obviously too much energy there. But on the other extreme, you have the places that don't use enough energy. And for instance, here an example is Haiti, in which the average person in Haiti consumes 0.7 hectares of land. Obviously, the problem in Haiti is the fact that a lot of people go hungry there. So you don't really want to live in those conditions. The magic number, the sweet number, is 2.1 hectares. Again, that today is the minimum amount of land that a single individual in the world requires to live well. Now. Let's do a quick mathematics here. Let's round the number of people at 7 billion 
and the amount of land required per person to two hectares. So seven billion people times two hectares, that gives you 14 billion hectares. Now you take a satellite image of the, plan, of the planet and calculate the amount of land that is available, you will find that there are 11 billion hectares. So that alone already tells you that humanity today is consuming three million hectares, three billion hectares more than what the planet can produce. Now, in this paper, one thing that I did there with my supervisor was an interesting calculation to calculate hum humanity's consumption in terms of planet Earth, right? So basically, again, I multiply the number of people by the area that they require and divide that by the total area available, and that gives you uh, humanity's consumption in terms of planet Earth. And here, what I allow you, to, what it allows you to do is to calculate this other figure here when we calculated an ecological, uh, human ecological demand and it's calculated in terms of planet Earth. So what you see from this plot is that it was back in the 1980s when humanity, the size of the world's human population was large enough to be kept sustainably over time, right? In the 1980s is when the number of people was large enough for the planet Earth to sustain that people at 2.1 hectares. After that, unfortunately, the number of people start going beyond what the planet can sustain, and that led to what we call a status of overshot. As I point out to you, today we are consuming 3 billion hectares more than what the planet can produce. So an extension that I did on this paper was then to calculate the cumulative overshot over time, and that allowed me to calculate this figure here, in which we show that by 2050, almost regardless of the scenario, there is gonna be an ecological deficit of 25 planet Earths. Just think about that, man. 2050 is gonna be a crazy time for humanity when over time or unsustainable use of nature leads to, to an ecological debt that will require the planet, 50 planets to pay. So again, when we talk about unsustainable this is the mathematics that I want you to keep in mind. The fact that even today, we are using more than what the planet can produce. And that is very obvious on the fact that you get a lot of people going hungry and a lot of species going extinct. So that alone is an indication of, of what is, why is it that we are so unsustainable. But these are the mathematics that I would like you to use when you are asked the question where we are sustainable or not. Now, Again, continuing with why is it that biodiversity is important, biogeography is important. One key question that you will see on most sciences is how do we maintain biodiversity? Well, it turns out that for you to protect, for you to maintain biodiversity, we need to propose solutions that will protect biodiversity. Unfortunately, for you to, to propose solutions, how are we gonna protect nature? You need to have some prior understanding that will ensure that this is effective, right? One of the first pieces of knowledge that you need to have is to understand the causality of the threat. By this, I mean to identify the specific factors that are leading to the transformation of biodiversity. The reason why this is important is because then it will allow you to identify what is it that we are gonna protect. Let's say, for instance, that biodiversity is declining because of overfishing, but there is the possibility that it could also be declining because of climate change. So as scientists, we need to resolve who is it that is causing the loss of a species? Is it overfishing or habitat loss or is climate change? So as scientists, we need to be able to resolve this, again, so that we can be more specific on exactly, is it, on exactly what is it that we need to stop to save biodiversity. The other reason why this piece of knowledge is important is because whatever you say, people is not gonna go easy on it. The reason being that there are a lot of people that is gonna be impacted by the decision that we propose. For instance, if we say that it's climate change, what is the driving the species, well, it's gonna be a lot of people that is gonna be impacted by this. For the United States, for instance, it has been calculated that it could be easily four, 40, $400 billion that will cost us to address the issues of climate change. Somebody has to pay for this, it's not gonna be cheap, so a lot of people is gonna oppose heavily uh, solutions on climate change. If it is fisheries, fisheries is $5.7 billion a year. So again, we say the oceans are being declined, are declining because of overfishing, we need to stop overfishing. Well, there's gonna be a ton of people that is gonna tell you, no, we're not gonna do this because the economy of many countries and many people around the world depends on it. If we say it's pollution, well, as a case example here, the, for the Florida case, 
It costs four million dollars a year just to ensure that the water that is dumping to the oceans is um, good in there. So again, you you get the sense here on the of why is it that is important for us to understand what what is driving biodiversity so that uh, whoever is impacted uh, accept that information and this obviously is going to increase compliance on whatever protection we suggest to protect biodiversity. The other piece of knowledge that is important, again, if you want to maintain biodiversity, is to understand the, cause, the, 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 the drivers of biodiversity. By this, I mean what is leading to a species to be more abundant in some places than other. The reason why this is important is because today there is a huge economic deficit on, on the implementation of these protections. So for instance, if we think about protected areas, today protected areas are working on only one third of the money that they need to be effective. So there is a huge economic deficit on all of, all of these conservation pro, uh, protection uh, solutions. Countries don't have the money. So the protection of biodiversity is something that gets very little money. So when we figure out exactly what is it that is driving biodiversity, one thing that we can do then is to prioritize these very limited resources on the places that we know are gonna be the most effective to protect biodiversity and eventually we can suggest that those are the places that need to be protected so that we can ensure that biodiversity is uh, maintained over time. Now, again, if the ultimate purpose is to protect biodiversity, what I want you to understand is that we need to understand what is driving biodiversity uh, here and also what are the impacts of humanity on that biodiversity. And these two pieces of knowledge are at the core of biogeography. And you guys through this class are gonna, we're gonna be focusing a lot on understanding these two different things. And again, they are, they, this is at the core of biodiver, uh, biogeography. And I want you to understand how is it that we contextualize what you guys are gonna be learning in this class as it relates to the protection of a species. Now, with that being said though, I'm gonna move on now to give you some feedback on how is it that biogeography research is done. All right, so we're gonna be deep, uh, diving in into a lot of scientific papers on biogeography, but what I wanna do in this first class is to give you a sense on how biogeography research is done. So whenever I introduce later on papers and things like that, you can figure out how is it that a scientist going to make those conclusions. So when you think about biogeography, really, all what it is, is this distinction between the pattern and the process. Generally speaking, a pattern is defined as the variation or lack thereof in the spatial or temporal distribution of things, right? So here are some examples of different patterns. So here I had a pattern that is uniform. Here is a pattern that is random, and here I had a pattern that is clustered. So those are patterns. Again, uh, uh, variations in the distribution of things in space and time. Those are generally what is defined as patterns in biogeography. Now, another important aspect of biogeography is the process. And the process is basically the mechanism that causes the pattern. In biogeography, you will find several patterns that have been identified already. We're gonna be going through some of them in, in this class, but there are tons of processes. Obviously, humanity, we're very curious and we, try, we like challenging information. So while there are a lot of patterns that have been very well defined, as it comes down to the processes, we're still trying to figure out why things are the way they are, and there are new ideas emerging all the time. So how scientists do this? Well, the, everything starts with you having an interest observation, and obviously uh, an interesting question, a pattern that you observe in nature, then you go and obtain the data, then you build a pattern, then you test hypotheses to explain this pattern. That's kind of the scientific approach that we had in biogeography to produce research on biogeography. Now, let's, let's narrow down on, on a specific attributes here. Let's start again with what is it what you are, that you are interested on. And this specific thing, we are interested on the system. The system could be as simple things as, for instance, uh, trees, ants, butterflies, lizards, fish, you name it. So you can be interested on any of these different uh, groups, and now we, in the given system, then you are gonna be looking at attributes, and several attributes can include things like the number of species, the body size, or the abundance of the species that are there. So again, that refers at, uh, here at, this, at the top, while well, you are trying to figure out what is it that you are gonna do, and exactly how you need to narrow it down, again, to a system and then to an attribute. Then you wanna obtain the data, 
There are different ways to obtain data in biogeography. One method that is commonly used is the transit. All what it is, is basically you take a, tra a tape, you put the tra tape on the ground, and at a certain distance on both sides of that tape, you either count the species, the body size, or the abundances of the species that are there. Another method that is commonly used is called the point count. And in this method, all what it is, you stand up on a given place and you count the attribute that you want to measure within a certain radius of, of the place where you are seen in there. That's the point count. The other one method that is commonly used is called the quadrat. And the quadrat, all what it is, is just a piece of PVC that you put on the ground. And normally you had a grid on that PVC and what you do is to count whatever you are, want to count on that, species, on that specific quadrat. So every one of these methods to collect data is obviously applied to the given system that you want to study. Like if, for instance, you are studying wells, you are not going to be using a quadrat. It's very unlikely that a well is going to pass by your quadrat. In the case of studying wells, most likely you're going to be using something similar or related to point counts there. Now, once I obtained the data, I had to build a pattern. Let me just give you an example of how to build this pattern. So let's take an example here. Let's imagine that this is my transit, and I, I went to that transit, and I count one species. And this point, I count two species. And I just keep going along my transit, counting how many species are there. Then I join the points, and that's your pattern right there. So if you observe this line that emerged here, you can already tell right away that there is a pattern here. There is a high number of species on this place, and it reduces on both sides as you move away. So that is in one dimension. You can also do the same kind of pattern on species richness now in, in grids. This is an example here in which we actually build the number of species in two dimensions. This is the number of species in the entire United States. You can also build patterns on body sizes. Here, for instance, is an example in which somebody collected the, the body size of a species. And basically what you do is count the number of species at different body sizes. So those are, again, examples of different patterns that you can build in biogeography. Now, once you build the pattern, you have to go and collect data to test different hypotheses to explain that pattern. There is a diversity of variables that you can use the internet and today humanity with, with access to the information. There are tons of variables that you can use. Here are some examples. You can look at, for instance, the number of people, protect the areas, temperature, hurricanes, you name it. Basically, what you try to do then is to establish if there is any relationship between the pattern that you found and the different variables that you analyze. Sometimes you get lucky and you find that there is one single variable that explains the entire pattern. Then you go and write your paper, and if you are lucky enough and your paper is interesting, it might get picked up by the news, and you are probably going to be happy for about a month. right? During that month, you are going to be the happiest person in the world knowing that you published an interesting scientific paper and made an interesting discovery. But I'm telling you in advance, you are not going to last happy very long. Because most likely, what will happen is that a scientists are going, to be, are going to start reading your paper and they are, they are going to start questioning what you found. And what it happens most commonly is that you have to go then back and reassess new hypotheses or new ways to analyze the data. And that, again, creates this vicious loop in which we are today, which is, again, trying to refine or understanding of the patterns and processes on biodiversity. And that kind of defines here the, the general process on how we produce information on biogeography. Let me give you some examples of patterns in general biogeography. This one on the species richness. The pattern of species richness, the latitudinal gradient of species richness is a, a pattern that is common to many taxa. And basically what it is, is that when you look at a latitudinal gradient from the North Pole to the South Pole and you count the species that you move along, you find that most of the species are always located in the this, in this tropics, right? Now, as it comes down to why is that the case, why is it that most species are in the tropics, there is a paper by Willick that took all of the scientific papers providing explanations for this pattern, and he found that there are 32 explanations already. Again, just what I explained earlier, while sometimes patterns are easy to identify, the process is a lot more complicated. Here is another pattern that is also commonly known. This is the latitudinal gradient in body size. It's also times, at times referred as Ber Berman's rule. So you take a latitudinal gradient, like I show here, from the North Pole to the South Pole and on the coast of the Pacific coast of the Americas. What you will find is that at higher latitudes, you had animals being larger than what they are in the tropics, right? That's what is called Berman's rule, and it's this relationship between the size, 
the body size of a species and the temperature. And normally what that results in is you having species that are much larger at higher latitudes than the species that live in the tropics. As it comes down to why that's the case, well, it turns out that there could be a combination of the amount of energy that is required to sustain that body, the amount of energy that is available on those places, and the capacity of that body size to maintain that energy. We're gonna be covering that at the end of this class, during this class later on. Another pattern that is interesting as well that we're gonna be covering in this class is the pattern of abundance. Again, the same deal. If we do a latitudinal gradient along the Pacific coast of the Americas, what you will find is that most of the species that live in the tropics are abundant. As we established, they are small in body size, but when it comes down to their abundances, they are actually quite abundant there. The explanation for this pattern could be again an, a combination between the energy requirements of the individual, the, um, the amount of energy available, and the life histories of those species that allow them then to optimize these trade-offs between what is available and what they need. Now, unfortunately, producing research on, biodiversity, on bio, biogeography has become a lot more complicated in recent times, mostly because of this issue of novelty. Today, there are tons of papers, like for instance, when you look at patterns of species richness and you go to Google and find out how much is known about this, you will find that there are over 400,000 papers already on species richness. In body size, there are 60,000 papers. In abundance, there are already over 90,000 papers. So there is an incredible amount of information uh, that is already out there, making it super hard for us to now publish new papers, again, related to this issue of novelty. Again, it has become very hard to find new insights into this biodiversity. However, that's not to say that there are new papers, and in fact, there are tons of papers coming out every year, but those new papers are not necessarily new, the description of new patterns or new processes, but rather the reinterpretation and critical observation of what we already know. Let me give you an example, for instance, of two examples that I find remarkable about how new research in biogeography is done. You look at these two squares here. I want you to pause this video in a moment and tell me whether they overlap or not. So it's very likely that many of you will say, yes, they overlap. You can clearly see an area here where the two squares overlap. Now, if I add another dimension to these squares, you will realize that they don't overlap at all. This interesting reinterpretation of that, that was a paper that was published back in the 1980s, and thanks to this critical contribution, this guy managed to resolve a huge controversy that was back in the day regarding the issue of niche. Basically, the fact that we had a species living in the same places, and when a species live in the same places and use the same resources, you will think that they will compete and eventually they will drive to extinction themselves. But when you look in nature, it turns out that they, the species were able to coexist. So that is crazy back in the day. How is it that two species use the same resources, they live in the same place, how is it that they are not driving themselves to extinction? What this guy managed to explain here is that sometimes by adding another dimension, at which you look at the things, you find that these species actually don't interact. For instance, in this case, he provided an example, like some species might use the resource during the day, the other species might use the resource at night, as a result, they find species are found in the same place using the same resources, but they never interact with each other. That's a way in which now a species can coexist. And in this case, that was an interesting insight that kind of helped out resolve a controversy that was there back in the day. Another interesting source of information that is leading to a lot of papers today is critical observation. I want you to look at this photograph. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a better photograph. This is the only one that I found, but all what it is, is just a chew, and there is a coral attached to it. I want you to take a moment, pause this video, and think, what do you make out of this? Now, the reality is that many of us probably will not make much of it. You, know, you go and see a chew, it looks just like garbage, and there is a, a coral attached to it. It doesn't look like much. Well, it turns out that back in the 1990s, here in Hawaii was this guy walking on the beach, probably in Waikiki. His name was Peter Jokiel, and he saw this. So what he did was, again, critical observation that neither one of us now managed to do. So it turns out that back in the day, there was this big controversy on how is it that some species of corals are found in the Caribbean when we know that they originated in the Pacific. So the idea came out that maybe what it happened was that corals originated on those two different places. And that didn't make any sense because 
probabilistically it's impossible. It's almost impossible for life to emerge on two different places. The idea of evolution is that we all come from a common ancestor. So unfortunately, we just couldn't explain why was it that corals were in the Caribbean where there is no way for those corals to get there via their, their normal mechanisms of dispersal. Huge controversy, people were going at it like you guys cannot imagine. Peter Jokiel walks on the beach, sees a tube with a coral, and what he discovers here is that then these corals are capable of attaching to devices that float in the oceans. As a result, these corals can move everywhere around the world, dropping off their babies everywhere. So thanks to this critical observation of something that was staring at the eyes of everybody, he managed to resolve an issue that was going on for years there. And here again is some insights on how new information is being generated in biogeography these days. Here's another example that, that I want you to think about. This is a movie that I saw back in the day that I found remarkable. This is a, a movie called The Sixth Sense. If you haven't seen it, unfortunately, I'm going to ruin it for you. But this movie I find very interesting because in this movie, uh, they show Bruce Willis early on in the movie. He's in his in his bedroom and somebody comes from out, from out of the bedroom and he shoots Bruce, uh, Bruce Willis. It turns out that the guy who shoot Bruce Willis was a patient of his that he sent to a place where people, crazy people live. And because this guy was used to see dead people and Bruce Willis said that the, the guy was crazy, he was sent to jail for life. Anyway, after that, the movie starts by Bruce Willis helping this kid that can't see the people. And the entire movie is about Bruce Willis helping the kid cope with this problem that he can see the people. And you can see Bruce Willis going out with, to dinner with his friends. And the entire movie is just about Bruce Willis interacting with the kid. At the end of the movie, I'm not joking, one minute before the end of the movie, you can see Bruce Willis' wife wearing his ring and you realize during that during the entire movie, Bruce Willis was dead. That to me is mind blowing and it's a beautiful example of this issue of reinterpretation. Again, going back to biogeography, today we see patterns and we make sense of those patterns and those patterns make sense to us quite a lot. But the beauty of it is that you can come up with a different way to interpret this and the same evidence that we had used before could be used to now see patterns in a completely different way, just like in, those, in this movie. During the entire movie, you think that Bruce Willis was alive just to come to realize one minute before the end that Bruce Willis was actually dead all along. You go back and analyze all of the evidence, it made a lot of sense that the guy was dead all along. So again, the same thing could potentially happen in biogeography in the sense that we have patterns and processes, and it could be matter of just somebody coming along, and again, as I explained before, having a critical interpretation, critical observation or reinterpretation of what we see what, that will potentially change the, the way in which we see nature today. Unfortunately, if you were to do research on biogeography, you are going to be facing a lot of different issues. Let's just go through some of them. The first issue is the amount of sampling. We already established that there are different ways that you do sampling. Unfortunately, when you start sampling biodiversity, you will discover that when you start counting, for instance, the number of species as you add area, you find this very fascinating pattern that is called the species area relationship. Basically, as you increase the amount of area that you sample, the number of species start increasing, but there is a point in which the number of species flattens. What it means with this then is that if you wanna sample how many species are in a given place, you need to calculate this optimum sample size. So there are mathematical equations out there that allow you to calculate what is the minimum sample size that you need to count the actual number of species. Unfortunately, this is something that is not done commonly. As a result, a lot of the knowledge that we have today could potentially be biased because of the fact that we haven't sampled many places to the optimum level. The other issue is about the location. Well, it turns out that species, they live over many places and you need to ensure that whenever you do your sampling, the sampling that you include as, as you try to describe patterns or processes is representative or the entire area that, that the species live in. And again, that's another issue that in biogeography, why we don't deal quite well in the fact that many times we don't even know where the data comes from when we put uh, these, these patterns together. Another issue is the standardization of the data. You hear commonly on scientific papers that we always try to standardize data so that we can compare apples to apples. Unfortunately, sometimes the standardization of data leads to potential errors. Let me give you some examples. 
let's imagine that you had a site and in that site there is the, the background spe species area relationship that you have here say that you take a sample and you try to standardize then the number of species by the area that you sample in this case you will get a certain ratio but if you double the amount of area that you sample because the saturation of the species richness you ended up with a completely different ratio again here the ratio probably is going to be a lot larger because you had a smaller area that you sample here the ratio is going to be a lot smaller because you sample a larger area so as you can appreciate here for the same site this standardization by area can give you completely different results at the end of the day you had the same number of species but you get two different values here again a potential issue of the way that you standardize the data a way to deal with this is commonly to linearize this line using different logarithmic scales and that sometimes resolves this issue there here's another example something that you commonly hear in scientific papers is that we always try to use the same number of samples everywhere so that we can compare equally different places well it turns out that Again, for the species area relationship, something that is actually not quite correct. Let me give you an example. If you go to a place at a high latitude, and again, you sample the area, it turns out that in, in the trop higher latitude, you need a very small area sample for you to count all of the species there because there are not a lot of species to begin with. Now, if you go to the tropics, it turns out that the area that you need is a lot larger. So now, if you try to use the same number of samples to compare high latitudes to the tropics, it turns out that you ended up with a unbalanced representation of the species from those places. A higher latitude, a smaller sample, will per perhaps be sufficient to identify all of the species that are there, but the same amount of sampling area could potentially be insufficient in the tropics. So again, a potential issue as you try to standardize data. One solution to this problem that has been resolved, that has been suggested, is the use of asymptotic lines so that you use an area that allows you to capture all of the species on this place. So what you are trying to compare really, you are comparing one place to another, is the total number of species on those places rather than the number of species in certain amount of area. Because as I explained here, you can get completely different values in different places. Another issue that is commonly found on biogeography is the timing of the sampling. Let me just give you an example. Let's imagine that you want to measure temperature in the Galapagos Island. And let's say that you go there only during the summer and you say, I'm going to sample temperature three times, but it's only one summer. So what you are going to find is that the temperature of Galapagos Islands is pretty hot. Well, no, it's no surprise you went during the summer. So now an alternative sampling is you go maybe every summer every time that you had a break you go and do research in the galapagos island you measure temperature the temperature is still going to be pretty hot there's going to be some variability because you have now three summers but it's still not going to be a representation real representation of the temperature in galapagos so most commonly the best suggestion is to use sampling that is random so that again you potentially you can capture the real patterns that you are trying to measure and again so uh, here is another issue as it relates to the timing. When do you do the sampling to assess not only patterns, but the drivers of those patterns? Here's another example about the timing of when you do the sampling. So biological systems, we know that they are viable. So let's imagine for a moment that this red line here is the number of species on a place, and that blue line is the temperature of the same place. So. If you, depending on the timing in which you monitor the pattern and the process, let's say that you sample on a very short term. So in this example here, you, you find that the temperature of the one place can get very cold or very hot, but during that time, there was no change in the biodiversity of the place. So you can conclude then that there is no temperature doesn't influence the species because while the population change, sorry, while the temperature changed, the population did not. Right, so in this example, by us using data that is short term, you can conclude that some value might not be important. Now, if instead you use a long term sampling, what you will find is that at times, any dip that you find in biodiversity coincides with a dip in temperature. And while there is some variability in the temperature itself, it turns out that there is some level of concordance between the two things. So again, that's another issue that is commonly found in biogeography is the time when we do the sampling. Sometimes you see conclusions that, 
that reject the importance of certain variables, and many times it could be just simply the fact that those variables haven't been sampled on the right times. The other issue, again, when you, that, that you see commonly identified in biogeography is the issue of a scale. Let me give you an example of this issue of a scale. Let me take an, a problem. The problem is I want to move from point A to point B, okay? But what I'm going to do is change the scale of the problem. So if I want to move from point A to point B, that's my problem, what will be my solution? Well, if my point A is here and my point B is there, probably the best solution is just to walk, right? At that scale of here to there, the solution is to walk. Now, if I change the scale and now I make point A the bed in my house and the bathroom of my house, well, at that scale, maybe walking is still a suitable solution. If I now change the scale of the problem, again, moving from one place to another, but now point A is the first floor and point B is the second floor of Sanders Hall, you will realize now that there are different solutions that could be potentially better, like taking the elevator. Now, if point A is Manoa and point B is Waikiki, again, it's the same problem, moving from one place to another, I'm just changing the scale. In this case example, you realize that maybe walking is not a solution anymore. If I make point A Honolulu and point B Paris, at that, at that scale, walking is certainly not a solution anymore. So that is something that you see commonly, quite commonly, not only on biogeography, but in conservation, this issue of us taking data at a very small scale and try to extrapolate that data at the global scale. And unfortunately, what happens is that you find variables that might be super important at one scale that are completely irrelevant at other scales. So that is another issue that is common to biogeography. Again, this mismatch between patterns and processes and the scales at which those patterns and processes are analyzed. Now, there are also statistical analysis as you start comparing or trying to identify what are the drivers of patterns. One common statistical analysis is what is called pseudo-replication. Pseudo-replication is basically samples that are not necessarily independent from each other. Let me just give you an example here. Let's imagine that I had two aquariums, and in one aquarium I had a control, and in the other aquarium I increased the temperature, and I find that no fish die here, but most of the fish die here at 35. So my conclusion is that the fish die at 35 degrees, and my sample size is 1,000 individuals. In this case, my conclusion is biased because it's pseudo-replicated. These 1,000 individuals that I use to make the calculation are pseudo-replications. Basically, I took all of the fish from the same aquarium. So ideally, you want to have maybe different aquariums on different places so that when you make a conclusion, the conclusion is robust, meaning that the samples are actually independent from each other. In this case, all of these fish are exposed to the same aquarium, the same water, so they are not necessarily independent. So your conclusion based on those fish is not robust despite the fact that you use tons of fish. The reason being that they are pseudo-replicated. For instance, you can imagine this aquarium being closer to a window that gets exposed to sunlight, so now you are exposing those fish to not only temperature but sunlight. At the same time, they die at a as lower, lower temperature. So that is, again, pseudo-replication. There are multiple issues that result from that pseudo-replication. And there is a paper here by this guy, Holbert, that I, that I uh, invite you to check out if you are interested in better understanding this issue of pseudo-replication. The other statistical issue that is commonly found on the scientific literature as it deals with biogeography is what is called self-correlation. Let me just give you an example. Imagine that I take a variable that is completely random and I relate that variable to another variable that is completely random. As you can expect, they don't relate at all. Here is an example of something that I did in Excel, and you can see that they are, the two variables are not correlated to each other. Obviously, they are random. Why will they be related to each other? Now, it turns out that one thing that you find commonly is people trying to standardize these variables, and commonly, they standardize the variables by area. In, which, in that case, if I standardize these two variables by the same area, what I find now is that the two variables are highly correlated to each other. Now, despite the fact that they are, in principle, not related at all, the reason why they become related to each other is because they are standardized by the same variable on both axes, and that is what is called self-correlation. So correlation, again, is when you have multiple variables that you are analyze, analyzing that are sometimes standardized by, by a common variable. That obviously results in the variable being similar to each other, 
not because they relate to each other, but because they are being standardized by a common variable. Another statistical issue that you will see commonly is multicollinearity. Let me just give you an example. Imagine that you have two predictors, like for instance, rainfall and humidity. You can assume that the two variables are related. So when it rains, the humidity goes up. When it doesn't rain, the humidity goes down. Let's imagine that I had a response variable, let's say species richness, and I wanna find out, for instance, if species richness is in, uh, affected by rainfall. My expectation is that whenever it rains, places that rain a lot, there are gonna be a lot of species. Places in which it doesn't rain, there is not gonna be many species. And indeed, I find that my predictor one explains certain amount of the variance of my response bio. Unfortunately, because predictor one is related to predictor two, it turns out that then predictor two has to explain some variance that is already explained by predictor one. That is what is called, again, multicollinearity. And that is a, an issue that is found very commonly in biogeography, especially on papers that analyze, analyze only one bio. So you find very commonly people providing explanations for patterns based on just one variable, it turns out that you might at times find that the one variable is significant, not necessarily because that one variable causes the pattern, but because there is another variable that correlates to your independent variable that in, in, in turn influences your response variable. That again is what is called multicollinearity. Again, is when, when multiple independent variables are related to each other. And that had been identified in a paper by Graham is one of the major sources of us having potentially grown conclusions about what are the drivers of biodiversity. Let me summarize the entire class. The ultimate goal of biogeography is to publish scientific papers. Obviously, we want to leave a, a, an evidence, a greeting evidence that the research was done. The way in which we do research in biogeography, again, you choose a, a system that you want to study. Within that system, you look at an attribute. You obtain the data, build the pattern test hypothesis, and you finish publishing your paper. We identify what, that while the process is simple, there are multiple problems here regarding data reliability, the way in which the patterns are constructed, like for instance, the way in which the data is standardized. When we are testing hypotheses, we might encounter num numerous statistical issues like the right scales, collinearity, pseudo-replication, and self-correlation. That's it for today. Let me just summarize the class. Today, we look at the attributes that are important there for life. We then move into understanding why is it that biogeography is important, and we highlighted that biogeography is important, that the species are important not only in terms of the right to be here, but in the fact that they produce goods and services that are important for humanity. Biogeography is the field that studies the distribution of those species in space and time. That biogeography is important for us, for instance, to preserve those species. In the second part of the class, we also look at how is it that people do biogeography research, and we describe, again, the general process and some of the limitations. And that's the class for today. I see you guys in the next episode. Wow. Oh,